Okay, guys, so we are live. It's Ishai Bresla, where I hope all is well with you. But before we start, I check all my connections, so we make sure that we're good. We're not wasting our time. So if you hear me and see me, I'd love for you to yell, holler, comment, and say, we hear you, we see you. I see that on LinkedIn. We're not yet live. Let's take a look. Okay, I think we are. Okay, here we are. Let's see. Are we live on LinkedIn? Are we good on LinkedIn? Yes, we are good. So we are about ready to start officially start the show. We are. So hi guys, this is Ishai Breslauer, the CRE Shark Eye Show, where we discuss we discuss commercial real estate. And on Mondays, basically, we dive deep and we dissect the market. We get into some asset class and we dive deep into it. Thursdays are usually dedicated more for inspirational. But today we have a very special guest and we would love to dissect what's going on in the retail market because she is all retail, she is all real, she has tons of experience and knowledge, she's a teacher, she's an influencer, she's everything in social media, everything that is connected to retail, she's the canvassing queen, she is Beth Azor. Beth, it's such a pleasure to have you, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Yishai. I'm so excited to be here. My pleasure. My pleasure. And I'll tell you something. Watching all these YouTube videos and see how you educate the world with what they should do with retail and all that stuff. And I have so much to ask and so many things that we have to talk about today. So um, uh, before we even start, if you are watching it, if you're going to catch it, whether it's in the beginning of the show, the middle of the show, after it's being you know, uh, how do you say, after, after it's live on YouTube, in the podcast itself, what we're going to do today, if you are remotely interested in retail, and definitely if you are in retail, you cannot shut it down. You have to listen to the end because you're going to learn in this hour more than you can imagine. And I can tell you it because of me, and I'm a guy who does retail, meaning I've been, I've been doing prospecting, I've been underwriting, and guys, you're going to learn tons. So, um, Beth, you know what, before we even start, you know, and I, I want to hear your story, but before we hear your story, just tell us in the, on the surface for the people who don't know you, because there's some probably, um, who are you and what do you do today and what is your business? So I'm Beth Azor. I'm in the South Florida market. So about 30 minutes from Miami, I live in a suburb of Fort Lauderdale and I own six shopping centers within 10 minutes of my house. And they're worth about $87 million. And I travel the country helping leasing agents fill vacancies in their shopping centers. So some of my clients are Kimco, Bricksmore, Phillips Edison, high net worth family offices, and small portfolio owners like me. Sounds awesome. So you, I know that you are on the ownership side. We're going to talk about this on the ownership side and on the you know, advisory side also. And we're going to speak about the, you know, how to fill those two sides. Not everybody could do them, you know, those two things. But, you know, before we start, tell us your story a little bit, where it started all this, you know, this whole thing. Where did it all start? So I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I'm a cheese head and my parents were entrepreneurs um, and had unbelievable work ethic. My, we had a bar, a tavern, like kind of like the Cheers show in Milwaukee. My dad worked for a brewery. My mom was an executive assistant for the Milwaukee Bucks owner. So uh, I knew the Milwaukee Bucks when Lou Cinder was the center, not Kareem wow. Abdul-Jabbar. And um, we, we lived in Wisconsin because that's where they were from. My, we decided, my dad got his real estate license when I was about 12 and he started, he left the brewery. He's running the bar with my mom. It was a quasi burger joint. Like I said, like the corner bar in, in Milwaukee, there's a bar on every corner and it's just like cheers. And my mom would run bowling leagues and pool leagues. And, it, and we had volleyball picnics on Sunday. They'd close down the joint and we'd go to the park. It was really fascinating how they how they created experiences and memberships to grow their business. It's all coming full circle. You're shy right now. Like I look back and go, boy, if they were really ahead of, ahead of their game. And then my dad got his real estate license and he sat at the kitchen table 
Yashai, do you know what a, a phone book is? Yes, I do. I remember those things. So he would sit I at recall the correct. Yeah, he would sit at the dining room table or the kitchen table and literally on the rotary phone make cold calls to sell lots in Florida. And I watched that as, you know, um, like a mid-teen. And we took a trip to Florida. And while we were on vacation, they bought a house. So we went back to Wisconsin. We sold the business. We sold some other real estate that we had, my grandmother's house. And in 90 days, we moved to south, to uh, a, a, an area called Flagler Beach, Florida, which is in the middle of the state. And I loved it. I, I went from a from a high school that had 800 kids to a high school that had about 200 kids. And I did everything. I got, I was very involved. I was a cheerleader. I know that surprises you. I played on the softball team. I, I was the editor of the school newspaper. I was very involved. I then went to college, Florida State University, was very involved there, not academically, but really involved socially. And I um, left there. Those usually, those usually become the best. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like what, what, what would a biology, what would I have learned in a biology class that I could have used exactly. today? I'm not sure. So I left there with a communications and PR degree and started working at a not-for-profit, the American Heart Association as a special events coordinator, loved that job, loved it. But I started making 11 grand a year and that's like about 30 today. So when you, when your parents are in real estate, cause then when they moved to Florida, they opened a real estate office at 18 in, in mostly in, at least for sure in Florida, if you're a kid of realtors, you get your license at 18. So I had my license at 18 and during college summers, I would sit open houses and, and do pass out flyers. I would do things to help them. So I get this job at the Heart Association, loved it, but can't live on 11,000. So on weekends I would do residential real estate. And I got a job at, with a developer and I sat in a trailer and, you know, people would walk in and I'd show them the model homes. So I did that two years straight, worked seven days a week, two years straight. And my, uh, my job at the heart got, went from 11 to 23,000, pretty good. But the executive director brought me into her office one day and said, we love you, but your ambition exceeds us. You should go do the real, real estate thing full time and just volunteer for us. So really grateful for her because you know it was a it, it not for profit you can't make the money to sustain right. the lifestyle that I wanted to have so that's what I did and the weekend job I was becoming more and more successful so they wanted me and they were pressuring me to come full time so I did that and I was miserable from day one because I loved my job as a special events coordinator and I really didn't love the whole real, the residential real estate thing. So while I'm there, I meet a young woman who is still in the retail business today. She works for Kimco and she was helping out the developer and she said, you should get into commercial real estate. And I said, oh, gross, that's selling land, isn't it? That's more boring than this. And she goes, no, no, there's this thing called leasing and developers build shopping centers and you as the leasing agent help the bagel guy or the um, boutique person, you help them achieve their or realize their American dream and you are invited to every bar mitzvah, communion, wedding, you're part of the family. I'm like, sold, I love that, where do I sign up? And she said, there's a company in Miami called Terra Nova and they have a training program for leasing agents. So I called down there and I say, who is in charge of your training program? And they said, a woman by the name of Donna Abood. And I said, Donna Abood that went to Florida State? They go, yeah, well, she was a sorority sister of mine. You're shy. So she picks up the phone and says, you're Whoa. hired to meet the boss. We had 11 people. I grew through the company. I was there 18 years. After 12 years that I was wow. there, I became the president. And when I left, we had 150 people and I went out on my own because I was working 80 hours a week. I was now a single mom of a four year old. My nanny was raising my son. And at 44, I didn't I said I didn't have a child at 40 to not be a good mom. So I kind of semi retired. And I said, I want to start. I had been buying deals with him, my former partner and boss. And I wanted to start buying deals on my own account. And my goal was to buy one deal every two years, which I've overachieved that. I own six now, but I've bought and sold and developed and done all kinds of things. 
when I left the first year, I was the room mom and the t-ball coach, and I was doing and doing charitable things again because I had time. And the phone started ringing from the REITs saying, "You've been training people and leasing your whole career. We've been watching this team you've built. We want you to come train." and coach our people. And that's how this side hustle of teaching has occurred. And unlike you, I wasn't a teacher and I, I applaud you. I applaud you for being a teacher. I, I once hired a teacher, a, a man walked into my office one day and hand, handed me a resume and it said teacher of the year in Miami. And I said, I can't hire you. I can't take you out of the school system. You're the teacher of the year. And he goes, well, it's you or someone else. Cause I'm leaving, but I love teaching. I think I was a teacher in another life. So I love watching leasing agents grow, and I love that part of my business that I have now. So first of all, you're excellent at it, from a teacher to a teacher, as we call it. I'm not a teacher now, meaning, but I've been that for many years. Uh, but I, one thing I want to ask you is you call yourself the canvassing queen, meaning I know why, right? But exactly. But do you want to tell us why that name specifically? Well, you could call it a retail clean, the retail queen, or something like that. But right, but so here's why. And I didn't give myself the title. I was awarded the title by the folks in South Florida. Um, I believe that the only way, or, or one of the main ways, to lease retail space is to obviously talk to people and be proactive talking to people, and not waiting for the phone to ring from sign calls. And so. From very early on, back to my Terra Nova days with Donna Abood, they trained us to go out and prospect. So canvassing means going shopping center to shopping center, store to store, walking in and saying, hey, I, I have shopping centers. Are you looking to expand? And, you know, many times you'll get the gatekeeper, but you'll get information. You'll see how the space is merchandise. You see how busy it is. You see if they have you know, more than one location. You see um, other markets they're in, so you know other markets to canvas. You learn of new businesses. Like we can cold call and we can social media um, digitally canvas, which we'll talk about digitally prospect. But what, and I, I, when I'm out canvassing, I find deals to buy. So I still canvas every week because I'm out. Yes, I'm filling my vacancies, but I'm also, I have a different eye who, what properties are full and and have rents lower than they should. So, so I'm called the canvassing queen because I have been talking about this. I'm 60. I've been in the business 34 years and I have been talking about canvassing for probably 30 years. And I've been at ICSE conferences and other conferences where people will challenge me in the audience and say, canvassing doesn't work. It's a waste of time. And so I fight that fight. And, uh, and that's why people call me the canvassing queen. That's so interesting because today could be an argument, but still, and we're going to talk about this, about what's going on today. But the, what I want to tell you is, you know, from the perspective, and that's something that I know for sure, there's a huge difference between being on the ownership acquisition, that side, right? And being on that, what we call the canvassing side, the advisory side, the side of leasing, all that stuff. And there's a huge difference, especially ownership usually don't want to get involved in that kind of stuff. And that's why they hire the brokers that know their stuff. Can you tell us where those things come together? They should always come place? together. I don't think there's a difference at all. I have had clients who have said, I can't fill my shopping center. My brokers aren't bringing me deals. And I go, it's time for you to canvas. And I've literally partnered or Beautiful. gone to different markets and drag them and say, come on. And I've done it many, many times. And boy, do their eyes open. They're like, first of all, this is so right. easy. Second of all, why didn't my brokers or my third party, you know, uh, representatives know, you know, I, I remember a case where I was in the panhandle in Destin, Florida, and um, my client had for one year, not one lease on his property. And he said, you know, I need to hire you. I said, I'm not coming to lease your property. This is in the panhandle of Florida. I said, I'll come up and canvas with you for a day and let's figure out what's going on. And he goes, what does that mean? I go, we're going to go and talk to tenants. He goes, we are. And I'm like, they are your clients, your potential clients. Don't you want to find out if you're charging too much rent? You know, what is the problem? So 
I, so he goes, okay, I'm game. And we go up there and we found, I am not lying, Yashai, five prospects. He signed three deals in the next 30 days. That's amazing. You know what? I, I agree with you so much because, you know, I, meaning I had number of, numbers of attempts to go into retail. And I remember I was, everybody was asking me, why do you actually do the walkthrough? The walkthrough is probably the most important part, meaning in the acquisition side. And that's prior to the whole canvassing side and so on and so forth. But when we went through and we went into the stores, I, I not only looked at the building, looked at the structure, looked at the you know machinery, looked at the maintenance and all that stuff. I looked, we got into the stores and we started talking to the people in the store, meaning the, the whether they're managers or people who work in the store and the information there was priceless. Like, for example, there was someone who said, we asked them, are you happy with what's going on? They said, Actually, not so much. One of the stores, one of the anchors actually said, I'm not so happy. Why are you not so happy? And he says, uh, you know something? Because the landlord, meaning the current landlord that at the time that we were trying to buy it from, and he's he had the car show. Once, once a year, he had a car show. And that car show brought us such revenue. And he just stopped the car show because it was too much mess, killed us. So just... How would you know if you wouldn't be talking to people? So that is uh, just one little tiny example of, of that. So thank you for that. What I want to shift a little bit to is if you could walk us through, educate us a little bit uh, into what makes a shopping center a winner versus a loser. Sure. So I'll give you my criteria of what I look for to buy, and then that will tell you what I think are winners, okay? Awesome. I like properties that are parallel to the street. I don't like U-shaped properties. I don't like properties perpendicular to the street because retailers want exposure and visibility. So, you know, I was, someone just sent me a property yesterday and it's perpendicular to the street, so there's one good space. I go, I don't want that. And I also don't want elbows where when you have a U-shaped property, 90% of the vacancy in the in the US are in the elbow spaces, those little corner spaces where there is zero visibility yep. and zero parking. So so I like them parallel to my street. I like to be in I, I'm a big believer, even though I've never taken an economics class in my life in supply and demand. So I want properties in an area where there aren't 150 more. So people call me all the time. I've got this great deal. It's only 20 bucks a square foot. I'm like, uh, okay, where, you know, and they say the city and I go, well, that's because there's 150 other shopping centers around that, that are all vacant. You're never going to get the rent. Rent is a commodity and you're going to be playing the free rent game. I'm not interested. I'd rather buy a five cap deal with $40 rents that are 100% leased that I think I can take to 50 because there's nothing around it. It's a high demand, low barrier to entry. So I love 100% leased shopping centers. I think 100% leased shopping centers, the rents are too low. I also love centers that have dual um, purchasing segments of the day, meaning in near residential where there's an evening and weekend segment and during the lunch hour where there's a lot of daytime population, i.e. colleges, hospitals, and daytime population, meaning corporate offices. Because if I have the breakfast and lunch crowd for the hospitals, the colleges, and the corporate, and then at night and weekends, I have residential. So that's what I look for when I'm buying properties. So first of all, that, thank you for that. A question about this. When you have a street, there's a huge difference between a street and a highway because a highway needs an exit. So what's your criteria when it comes to that? I prefer a street than a highway exit. I no, mean, I, I mean, if it, it depends on what, if, if, you, if you gave me five acres at an exit, with, you know, a hundred thousand cars, you know, in North Carolina uh, off of I-40 and I could do four ground leases, you know, with fast food and, and there's, and, and the supply, the problem is, is there'd be a lot of supply of land. I don't like supplies of land, but if it's right at the intersection and maybe 
there's maybe the next north intersection is five miles and the next south intersection is five miles. So there's a food desert and I could do four or five, the burger guy, the chicken guy, you know, the full, um, the full day meal as we call it. Yeah. Yeah. So that commuter yeah. And, yeah, commu and gas. So I, I would be okay with highway, but my preference is not highway. My preference is streets. Cause I want the, the residents. Right. You want, you want the local. Yes. Uh, what I want to ask you is before we move on, you've been in the business for so, so long. And before we talk the post COVID COVID, this whole thing, what I want to ask you is what's the difference between the shopping center, the tenancy in the shopping center 25 years ago and pre COVID. Cause that's a whole different story. The post COVID, but I'm saying what's the difference that era, this era, in general. Yeah. 25 years ago, we landlords would not put more than 10% of restaurants in our properties. That's and incredible. Today, and, and today we put 50. That's incredible. Okay. So that's a huge difference that, that the anchor tenants hated restaurants because of the parking demand. Now the anchor tenants love restaurants because of the traffic. My, I have a small 42,000 square foot strip center that's unanchored. My anchor are the five restaurants that bring me $18 million of traffic. Crazy. So, you know, three years ago, three or four years ago, dining out, Yeshai, exceeded in-home dining for the first time in the history of our civilization. Dining out exceeded in-home dining. During COVID, it flip-flopped, but it'll come back, you know, because we were stuck in right. home. We'll talk about weren't open. That's a whole different topic. Yeah, but that will come back. The other thing that happened 34 or 25 years ago is we there was an online sales. So if you were um if you were TJ Maxx and you wanted to roll out a home goods, you did it in a rollout in bricks and mortar. Bed right. bath rolled out by by baby. Um Ross dress for less rolled out DDs. Now, so, so in the eighties, tenant rep was a phenomenal business because there were rollouts going all the time, big anchor spaces, junior anchors and big empty and big anchor spaces. If you had one category of books, Barnes and Noble, you had borders and, you know, someone else, right. At books, a million. If you had one pet store, you had two more. If you had one linen concept, you had two more. And the, and the rollouts were just wrap, wrap, what's the word I'm looking for? Rabid. So the rollout in the 80s and 90s of big boxes fueled the whole power center developments. That is gone. There's The rollouts don't happen anymore. They now will test their concepts online. That's incredible. Let's talk about this a little bit. Let's get a little bit to this whole e-commerce revolution, what it did, the Amazon, the Amazon, today it's the Amazons, you know, it's everything that's going on in the world. And uh, we know the story and I took, I meaning I gave a few lectures about that, but I really want to hear your perspective. And we know where we are now. We, we know that it, we know about the oversupply of retail prior you know, in general, I'm talking about generally countrywide, et cetera, et cetera, uh, pre-COVID. But then came the whole online revolution and changed everything literally. And right now we're in a different world. So even before we talk about what COVID did and what's coming up next and how long the recovery will be, that's something we're going to talk about. The whole world of e-commerce what did that do to the shopping center and to the co-tenancy and the ownership and everything else? And how, how can we look at a shopping center today when we look at this whole thing going? So I'm going to test you. Yes. What There's $5.4 trillion of retail sales as of November 2020. What percentage of the 5.4 was online sales, do you think? Or, uh, 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 uh. $5.4 trillion, how much was digital and online sales? What percentage? 
percentage of what industry you start, you're saying? No, right? what percentage of the of the, the total retail sales, which includes bricks and mortar and online, what percentage of the 5.4 trillion is just online, in your opinion? I would say 60%. Good answer. Bad answer. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Go ahead. 15. So, so mean people still want to go. Fake news. So they blow it way out of proportion. So currently it's 15. It got up to 16 in November. It dropped to 13 actually in December because Christmas sales, last minute people going to bricks and mortar. The, the predictors, the people out there who have the crystal balls say by 2030, it'll be at its max of 30. And so 20- are, you talking about the, are you talking about specific areas or countrywide type of statistics? I'm talking about online sales for five in the U.S. Five point four. U.S. Okay, that's what I was asking. Five point four okay. trillion dollars of retail sales in the U.S. currently. Only we're at fifteen percent of online, but people that's think incredible. People but- think it's sixty or eighty. I, I ask when I give my you know speeches in front of thousands of people. I go, how much? Yell out the number, and they go eighty percent. That's fake news. Okay. Okay. So let me test you on that one. When you come to um, when you come to the right, so so this it, it is surprising this number, but let me ask you this: when it comes to you know type of uh, types of retailers, I'm sure there's a huge difference between one type of retailer. I I wouldn't say that I know the exact answer. I know I have an idea. I saw statistics, but I want to hear from you, and you have experience and you you own those shopping centers. What type of retailer is the retailer of e-commerce? that is really going to 80% and the retailer that is in that criteria that you will want to have in your shopping center because they are the 15 and 10%. So and all the rest is brick and mortar. Right. So, so the online retailers that, you know, Amazon is the biggest seller of shoes, right? So the shoe stores, not a lot of shoe stores in brick and mortar. DSW and Rack Room are, you know, they're still out there, but we'll see what happens with shoes. Apparel is a huge online Amazon product. Um, right. My shopping centers are filled with restaurants and service tenants, hair salons, nail salons, barber shops, cell phone stores. Um, I've got a uh, massage, you know, massage envy, meditation studios, B12. Fitness what? Fitness Fitness, exactly. Fitness. So things that you can't get online. But, you know, do, right. you, do you know, you're, you're much younger than me, but do you remember when there was catalog sales, Sears and Penny catalogs? Yes, I do. So in the 60s, when there was catalog sales, they represented, later, yeah. they represented 10% of retail sales. So it's just a change in distribution. That's I all. Got it. So, yeah, but it's also but it's also a change in tenancy because in the, at that time you didn't have agree with me that you didn't have those many 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 restaurants like you said and many many you know you did have all those clothing stores Sears did exist today Sears have right. no right to exist but right we all know that that you know Walmart saw it coming and they played along and they knew what they're doing we all know the Target meaning in. They were in the back, running in the back, but they saw it coming also, and then they knew how to pivot, and they did it amazingly well. So we know who did well, and we know who did less, but uh, right, but the tendencies are different today, as you said, um, and that's and it incredible. Has, it has to do with time. You know, what's the one thing we can't buy? We can't buy time. So that has created the rise of the restaurants. It's created the rise of personal uh, services hair care. We don't have time. Busy working women want to get their nails done. They want to get their hair done. Guys want to go to the barber. We don't have, we want to be pampered because we're working so much and we want to go to places like dining that saves us time. No one wants to go home after working long days and cook a meal for their family. It's, it's impossible. You know something? What I want to do now is is dive deep a little bit because you have 
hands-on experience. And I, I was one of the, um, I think Marcus and Melchap uh, um, Zooms and you were there. And uh, it was very interesting to hear everything about retail, what's going on. We all know what happened to COVID and what COVID did to the retails, right? In, in general, I'm talking about the general aspect. What I want to ask you is, of course, we know the percentages everybody heard. If you want to repeat that a little bit, that would be great. But what I really want to hear is who did actually manage to keep their doors open to survive and who is actually post-COVID going to continue and keep on going? The winners have been the pet stores, the dollar stores, the restaurants who pivoted and got outdoor seating and parking lots and apps for delivery, um, bike stores can't keep a bike. I mean, now, you know, bike stores were the huge winners and now they're the losers because the supply chain is stuck on ships coming from China and they can't get merchandise. The same thing with the dollar stores. Dollar mm -hmm. stores and bike stores were huge winners and now they have empty shelves. And it's it's How, why why is that because they, they can't get it's a shipping it's a shipping thing from China, got they're, it you know they're they're stuck in the port there's there's I don't know if it has to do with COVID or regulations I have no idea but every bike store you know I have I had bike stores calling me to expand and then we started talking and they're like I can't get merchandise I can't expand so wow. um, Michaels and um, Joanne Fabrics is fi filing an IPO. We thought Joanne Fabrics was near, you know, the graveyard, and now they're filing an IPO because crafts, Great. arts and crafts. Um, Michael's speaking of online versus bricks and mortar. Uh, there was an article today in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Michael's was down sixteen percent third quarter twenty. They've been up, I think, twelve percent and eighteen percent in the stores first and second, or I guess uh, January and February and up 129% online, arts and crafts. People wow. stuck at home with their kids saying, we got to do something. So there's a lot of winners. Yeah. The, the losers are the dry cleaners, those poor guys, right? The hair salons that, you know, their customers were the older clientele that came in for their weekly sets. Those, those ladies aren't leaving their houses. So there are some losers, but shockingly enough, in all of my six centers, I only lost besides my peer one in Kirkland's who COVID or not would have closed because it's just that that concept is a dead concept. I only lost one tenant, one 1200 square foot tenant, which was a foot massage place. And she just said, she, she literally closed on March 23rd. I said, wait a minute, we don't even know what's going on yet. She goes, I know no one's coming. No one's going to want their teeth, their feet touched. So she's the only tenant I lost. And then I downsized, wow. I downsized a hair salon who had those weekly set ladies. And we, we downsized her, put her in a lesser location. She was at the main point of the property. But other than that, my tenant sales, you know, we've been lucky in South Florida. We've been reopened since May 28th. I started nice. canvassing Yashai June 6th. I started going out and canvassing. So, um, so we've been very blessed to be down here. But my tenants were back above pre-pandemic sales by the end of September. Wow. You know something? I want to shift gears a little bit. I, one of your uh, videos, I remember, I recall that you said that uh, you went into development in one of your centers. Then you said, I want to stop. And then you said, I'm going back to it. So a guy, I'm in development. So I, wh what, is all, what do you think about that? What is your experience uh, about development? Do you have children? I have five, thank God. They're, they're all big already. It's like childbirth, like right after childbirth, like I'm never going to do this again. And then you have, like, that's what happened to me. Um, it was very, very difficult, uh, but it was a huge win financially. So that's why I'm doing the second one now. I just finished the second one. I have a, a phase two that I'm going to do a ground lease. I'm very excited that I'm not developing it. I'm going to do a ground lease. It's just very complicated. I'm a leasing person, okay? I hire a mortgage broker to find my loans. I hire someone to do my underwriting. I just lease space. I have a good nose and I can find deals that I can find properties that I know I can lease. I'm a leasing person. So 
I, ha I have to hire out for all this other stuff that I'm not. And in my first project, I went through four project managers and um, it was painful. And I made a lot of mistakes. Luckily, I have a really phenomenal partner and he's like, we're going to learn together. <laughs> but we made an, eight, I made an $18,000 mistake. And I said, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put that in, you know? And he goes, no, no, no. I, I, Cause I kept saying to him, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> what are we doing? I've never done this before. So, but he's a great partner. And, and the, the deal turned out to be a huge, huge win. We bought it for 3.4 million. The NOI is over 700. Wow. And, uh, so of course, then when that happens, you're like, okay, maybe I'll dip my toe in again. So the second one, we bought an office building and we knocked it down and we built a, a mini star, a little Starbucks with two other tenants. And now I have a, a second phase. I'm going to do a ground lease. So, you know, and now, and now I'm looking at another one. So I need to stop. It's, it's, it's a disease. I'm telling you, I know it's addicting. But I have Addictive. now my very, I'm very happy now because I have a project manager who's phenomenal. It's, it's, it takes a village. And so I have a great land use council. I finally found the perfect, great, excellent project manager. I now have GCs I can count on that can deliver on time and under budget. So, you know, it's all about the team. Exactly. It's, it's all about great the, team. the right team. I always say it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, you know, my talent is my nose. I can, I can find a good deal and then I can lease it. And my, what my partner says is that's hard. That that's much harder than financing it, con constructing it, you know, underwriting it. That's hard. Those things are easy. What's hard is having the nose to find the deal and then the relationships to lease it. What I want to ask you is, you know, I always say, I always laugh at people that say, um, hey, uh, it's, uh, you know, the only best thing is, is that asset class, multifamily. I go for this. I go for that because I believe that if you know your stuff in wherever you are, you should stick around and be there and that's it. That's, that's what I believe in. But for all those who are saying that post COVID, uh, people should run away from retail and go into multifamily. What do you have to tell them? Go, then there will be more for Leave us. Leave us alone. We want the opportunities. <laughs> I, I, go, go ahead and go, go, leave. I don't want to compete with you. Um, so three years ago, I start, started seeing the multifamily craze. And um, so I invest passively with a multifamily um, acquirer, someone who buys them, that he doesn't develop them. And I have, you know, a good part of my investments diversified with him in his product smart, I did, yes. at 55, five years ago or 57, when I started investing with him, I did not want to go learn multifamily, but I, but I'm smart. And I think diversifying is right. And I think that you invest with a partner or a sponsor that knows what the hell they're doing. So I'm very pleased that I have some of my wealth into multifamily. I didn't want to go learn it, at 57, no way. So, so, but I, for everyone that thinks retail is awful and dead and there's, you know, an apocalypse, you should all go. Beautiful. I love that answer. Um, I want to ask you something, meaning for your advice, as we call it, online advice. Uh, what do you do when you find, when you are going in, into an acquisition of a shopping center and you have, and you're in the, I would say the heavy part of the due diligence, the legals, and all of a sudden, your attorney calls and says, listen, there's a huge problem with the co-tenancies. There's one anchor that sort of took over the whole thing. Meaning, what, what is a no-no from your experience? And what is uh, something that you could work through? Well, if I'm buying a property and let's say um, an anchor tenant says that you can't put a restaurant within a hundred lineal feet of my front door. And then I see that the, the seller did that and that the anchor hadn't found out about it yet. That's a lawsuit waiting to happen. So I'm going to say to the, to the seller, you know, I have a relationship with the anchor most likely, and I'm, I'm happy to pick up the phone, but it's go going to expose you and you have a problem and, and, and I'm not going to buy it and then have the anchor find out. And then there, you know, they go from, you know, 12 triple net to 50%, you know, uh, because it's a co-tenancy issue. I'm going to say seller solve the problem. 
And then if that, if let's say he calls the anchor, says, so sorry, we didn't know this was in your lease. We did this. The restaurant's killing it. We're not going to make them move out. And there's no like showing evidence of a, of a, of a negative implication to the anchor. Like what I like to do in my co-tenancies is sure. If we break your exclusive or we break your co-tenancy, then, um, and you can show a problem, you can show negative impact, then you can go to percentage rent only or whatever, you know, the cure is for the problem. But if they don't have that and it automatically goes to percentage rent and maybe there's no, you know, poop or get off the pot, at the end of a year, either you stay anchor or you go back to contract rent. Many times that's not in the leases. So I'm not going to agree to buy a center where my potential, my NOI potentially drops by significant numbers, but I'm going to pay the seller the number as if that, that NOI is whole. So I'm going to, I'm going to make it get straightened out before I go forward. Did that answer your question? Yes. It does. Let me ask you. Uh, I could. I could. In every question I have, I could ask hundred more. But you know, we want to be as uh, as diverse as I would say. We want to open the topics as many topics as we can. Um, what I want to ask you is, um, I want to jump into another thing. A lot of people are talking about, especially post COVID, about the net lease option, meaning versus meaning they say. Obviously, we heard from you what you think about shopping centers, but they say, listen, let's go with a safer zone of retail. And that is the net lease option with pharmacies and food, you know, and, and supermarkets and all that stuff. Um, what's your take on it? I think pharmacy is a terrible investment right now. I think Amazon's about to get, oh, get in at 100 percent, 1 million percent. The last thing I've been telling all of my friends grandparents who are own Walgreens and CVSs around the country to sell now because they're 13,000 square foot boxes, very strange, very difficult to backfill. The only backfilling of those are dollar stores and gymnastics studios. And you, you're probably going to end up knocking it down and redeveloping it. Great corners, but for the price that you're, they're selling for five and a half cap rates and the rents are not replaceable. So I think that's a terrible investment. I like, I do like other triple net investments, but you know, like what? probably Starbucks, Chipotle, Panera, um, Food. Uh, maybe car washes is a big deal now down here and throughout the country. Maybe I'd have to like see, but the, the whole membership the, the car washes are doing memberships now. That's very interesting. Um, I want to buy every bank I can find on a hard corner because I think there will be no bank branches and I want to redevelop bank branches. So if you can. Why? That's a huge question because we know what banks uh, today, online banking, who goes into a bank today? We do it all online. So what's your answer? So I want to buy bank branches for future developments. It's a covered land play because I don't. Uh -huh. believe Right. So I, I don't believe bank branches. I, by the way, exist. I love that. We'll talk okay. about this. Okay. So in, <laughs> in three to five years, those 3,000 square foot or 4,000 or 5,000 square foot bank branches with drive throughs won't be banks. So I want to buy them now. I'll buy the income stream. And when the banks wake up and say, mm, during COVID- I, I shouldn't be here anymore. Right. During COVID, yeah. the baby boomers figured out how to bank online and we need to close this branch, but we have four years left and they call me the landlord and they write me a check to go away. And that check will fund a future development between a Starbucks and a Chipotle with, and use the drive-through, which drive throughs since COVID drive-through prices are up 30%. So right. hard, hard corners at lights, banks, if you have them, bring them to me. I want to buy them. Okay. So that's a beautiful answer. I like that. And makes a very, very interesting perspective on what's coming up um a question meaning i want to go back a little bit for a second to the food issue uh, and uh we just you just explained beautifully how the drive through uh, drive throughs and all this fast food i would say uh, during during covid we saw the fast food booming right what's with the restaurants the sit down fancier restaurants what's with them 
So I was very concerned about them, you know, being closed for so long and we lost a lot of them. You know, we lost a hundred over a hundred thousand restaurants and the majority of them were sit down over 3000 square feet. But we, we cannot here in South Florida. And, and this is the telltale sign, I think for the rest of the country, we can't keep a second gen restaurant space available. We have just like residential where there's three to four or five buyers for every home that goes on the market. If you have a second gen restaurant space, I don't care if it's 5,000 square feet, we're getting multiple bids. People are coming from California, New York, Chicago, restaurant tours who have restaurant chains that are still closed in those markets. And they're saying 11 months, this has been going on. We need, we have chefs, we have a concept. We're going to go move it to where there's places that are open. So I think as places open, you will see more restaurants that the restaurant business will revive again. I don't know if you'll see 8,000 square foot Chinese buffets anymore. Like the whole buffet thing with COVID, I think has died a quick death. I don't think you're going to see salad bars, anything that there's, you know, where people are all. People, yeah. That's, smearing in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's not going to happen. But yeah. steak restaurants, I mean, su big sushi restaurants, we're seeing all of that down here in South Florida. So I think we are seeing what you guys will all see arrest around the rest of the U.S. You got it right. And Florida is more advanced in everything when it comes to those things. Um, let me ask you this. We all know what happened to the malls. The malls of the 80s. We're talking about the big, huge malls, right? The shopping malls that were created for families to go and enjoy and do all that stuff. And all the tryouts that came out to make it fun, fun. And I don't know, with skiing, <laughs> a resort within, I don't know, whatever. What is the future of all those almost white elephants? Many of them became. Um, what is the future of those? So the prediction is 30% of the malls will be closed in the next three to five years. So, and I believe that it could, it could get up to 50%. The, if, if a market like South Florida, we have, I think 11 malls, two are already, two have already gone back to the bank and probably um, we'll have three more that will do that. So in markets that have multiple malls, we don't need 11 in South Florida. We need maybe six. So that's what's going to happen. And then what's going to happen with those properties is they will be redeveloped into healthcare, uh, residential, and logistics, and corporations. In Cary, North Carolina, Fortnite, are you familiar with Fortnite? It's a video game. I'm not a big guy with those things. No. So there's this huge, huge, huge take took over the U.S. for you know eight to sixteen year olds, maybe maybe older. Fortnite. Um, they just bought a mall in Cary, North Carolina, for ninety five million dollars, nine hundred and eighty thousand square feet for their corporate headquarters. Amazon has bought two malls in the Midwest for logistics. Uh, here in South Florida, we have a Dillard's, we have a mall that Westfield, so Westfield has announced that they're leaving the U.S. They have 28 malls. They bought 28 malls in the U.S. They've announced in the next two to three years, they're leaving 100% the U.S. because they're big in Europe and Canada. And they uh, have given a, a mall near me back to the bank. A receiver's been assigned and the Dillard's is in negotiations right now for multifamily. It's amazing. World is changing 100%. That's what happens. Um, I want to shift gears into social media. And uh, you've been such a leader in that. What I want to talk about is the following. Um, so many people, meaning <laughs> I'm addicted to Clubhouse. I love that because I'm not there yet. And you have yelled at me already. And uh, yes, I'm learning slowly. I'm uh, meaning... <laughs> I'm probably going to get in there eventually. What I want to ask you is, first of all, the evolution in you of social media, meaning how did it come to you? And I'm talking about everything, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever you were involved in, and into Clubhouse. Tell us a little bit about this. So and what I, did you do your life? I need to have the date. And I'm, I'm thinking it was 
eight years ago, but I'm going, I'm going, everyone asks me this and I need to come up with the date, but I'm going to guess right now is eight years ago. I had a junior leasing agent work for me and she came in one day and I was not on any social media platform. I wasn't on Facebook. I wasn't on Twitter. I was on nothing. And Mackenzie walks into my office one day and says, I think we should start prospecting on Facebook. And um, shame on me as a teacher. I said, oh, that's ridiculous. I thought Facebook was ridiculous. And she said, no. And then I heard myself. And then as a teacher, I said, oh, no, sure. Go ahead, honey. See what see how that works for you. Again, terrible. And we signed a lease four days later with a chocolate store I'd been after for about 20 years. And I joined Facebook. And then I joined LinkedIn. And then I joined Instagram. And now I've joined Clubhouse. So from that fa- from that experience, I learned how powerful Facebook prospecting was and then Instagram prospecting. It's so it's it has has significantly higher returns than canvassing. I still canvas, but to be able to sit in your and and I don't know what we would have done during COVID had we not have the dig- digital prospecting, but I have used LinkedIn to be a thought leader to share my 34 years of experience. It's brought me training business. It's brought me much better relationships with my national retailers who are lurking on LinkedIn. Like you don't know they're there until you go to a conference and they go, Oh, I love that post about blah, blah, blah. I'm like, Oh, you're there. And now, and now clubhouse is um, it's clubhouse will explode and make all other social media platforms pale in comparison, which is why you have to get on. I hear you. Can you tell me a little bit about the differences? Uh, Clubhouse, I understand. Tell us a little bit about the difference uh, between, I would say, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and the activities when it comes to real estate business, you know? Sure. So, so Facebook, I use and Instagram, besides prospecting, we use it to publicize openings, construction, buying a new property, looking for vendors, you know, the community. Face, Facebook and Instagram is the community, the local community. So we have a, a, a Facebook group that has 679 at last count, landlords, tenant rep brokers, lawyers, everyone in the retail business. It's called the South Florida Idea Exchange. And people like, who reps FedEx? I have a new property I'm developing. I have a second gen restaurant space. Um, I just got hired by TJ Maxx and looking for three new, uh, you know, the exchange of what goes on between 679 people in South Florida only. It's amazing. On Facebook, and I talked to someone two weeks ago who who I said to he's my age, like probably 60, 50, 9, 60. I go, I said his name is Joel and he's anti-Facebook, anti-social media, but he's on this side. I go, if I would have I said, when did you get on this? He goes, like a year ago. I said, would you have ever believed what we get done on this Facebook group? It's it's phenomenal. So so that's what we use Facebook for. Instagram, um, all my young students, most of them are on Instagram. So young, I, define young 20 to 29. Okay. That's young. Yes. And they're and 95 are guys, 95% are guys. So I use Instagram to talk to my audience. You know, this morning I went out for my do a walk every day and I did an Instagram live and I talked about thing. I, I'm talking to them. So I'm coaching on Instagram, but I'm also posting things like, um, you know, we, we, I met a guy that wants to do a mobile gym on Saturday on one of my properties. I took a picture. I posted it on Instagram. I said, this guy wants to open 20 locations, call him. So I'm like sharing. So Instagram and Facebook are local and we, and they're, they're huge power horses for prospecting. So that's that LinkedIn is think tank. LinkedIn is college. It's, it's education. It's, it's connections. I've met a lot of people on, like I'll post the stop with the email blasts, the retailers hate it. And then I'll get this whole debate going back and forth about that. Or, or we're using AI placer mobile data. What do you guys think about that? So LinkedIn is more about 
what's going on in our industry B2B. So I'm not talking to the dry cleaner or the hair salon on LinkedIn that I want to come into my not shop. Communal. You're right. It's global. It, yeah. It's it's global. It's, you know, um, it's industry wide, I would call it. It's yes. industry wide. And, and so, and if like, right now I have a, I have a consulting assignment where I'm working across the country and I'm looking for who I need a tenant rep broker in Laredo, Texas. I put that on LinkedIn. I get five suggestions from people I know. This is how hard that would have been impossible. I would have had to have gone to Laredo, Texas before right. LinkedIn. Crazy. And Clubhouse came in. And what is Clubhouse in general? And what is it for you now? And why are you preaching so much to me to go into it? So club. So have you ever, do you remember talk radio, talk show radio? Yes, of course. So, so, you know, you'd have the radio, you'd have a million radio stations. I'm exaggerating to make a point and you could turn on sports, you could turn on politics and, you know, you could call in and you could say, Hey, I disagree with you about, you know, the Miami dolphins, they're going to go to the Super Bowl, and, you, and there was engagement. That's what clubhouse is. So clubhouse has a million rooms on a million different topics. So, and there's a lot on real estate. There's a lot on fix and flips. There's a lot on multifamily, self-storage, retail, et cetera. There's stuff on wine, sports, you name the topic. There is a room on Clubhouse. It's all audio. And um, I joined on December 30th. And Damon John from Shark Tank and Grant Cardone from the you know multifamily investor in Miami who has almost yeah. thirty thousand units, they were spending thirty hours nonstop over Easy. the January first weekend, and I said, "What the hell? There's something. There's something going on." No, no here. if Grant is there, right? Exactly. So, yeah. So I said. So then yeah. I put it out to the to my little world. I said, guys. And I, I was on it for about three or four days. It's very addictive. Um, and I said, okay, this is something. So I put it out to my friends and said, get on Clubhouse. So now I host room. So now I've been on it. And here's two things that have happened to me since I've been on it. One, I started something called Space Tank. So, so now Damon John, Barbara Corcoran, Mr. Wonderful, Cuban has not shown up yet. They are doing Shark Tanks audio where Crazy. the short tanks are there and people are pitching their businesses and they're giving, they're taught saying, yeah, we want to talk to you offline about giving you money. So I was watching that, trying to get ideas for retailers I could call to come into my shopping centers. And I said, Hmm, I wish we landlords could give money to tenants. And then I went, wait a minute, I have something more valuable than money. Really? I have space. So I reached out to 10 of my landlord friends and I said, I want to do something on Clubhouse called Space Tank. Will you agree to give 90 days free? And then we'll, we will then bring entrepreneurs to pitch us for the 90 days free. I, I got 10 landlords that would agree to do it. I put their logos on LinkedIn and I said, join us next week for Space Tank on Clubhouse where these 10 landlords will have entrepreneurs pitching them for 90 days free. The entrepreneur takes the space as is, gives insurance, a nominal deposit and pays utilities. Because I have done pop-ups during COVID that have turned into permanent leases and Bricksmore did 800 pop-ups during COVID, 800. So, because these are entrepreneurs you know, you know that Uber and Airbnb started in the 09 crisis. So there are very smart, intelligent, driven, inspiring entrepreneurs that will create businesses that will be the next Airbnb and Uber. So I get 10 people. I post it on LinkedIn. And you're shy. Three days later, I had 51 landlords. It was a FOMO thing. They're like, well, why aren't we in that list? So I had 51 landlords. We had 142 entrepreneurs signed up. 32 pitched and 29 of the 32 had three or more landlords trying to get them. And it's been amazing. We did our second That's event. Crazy. We did our second event last week. I had 74 landlords and we have matched um, 17 retailers got six or more matches. So we wow. are matching landlords and tenants on clubhouse. That's, that's amazing. But so no. I'll tell you what, we, first of all, it's incredible. We could go forever. We have 30 seconds. 
before it because I want it also to be on Instagram. So if you could stick around for a second, I want to thank you. I want to talk to you about two more things. And uh, I want to thank you. It was an incredible show. We could go for another half an hour at least, that's for sure. I have enough questions for that. But really, thank you so much for your time. And I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. And uh, take care. Just one second. Thank you, Beth, for being on our show. And uh, you guys, what I want to tell you is what I want to tell you. Let me just one second hit it. Okay. What I want to tell you is uh, we want, if you want anything, uh, connections. If you want the connection with Beth, what you have to do is to look at the links all the way around us. It's in the top, in the bottom, all the way around. You will have the links. You'll have the email. You'll have the phone number. You want to get educated. You want, uh, you want, to lease, you want uh, a space in one of her uh, in one of her uh, spaces, and uh, you could you could obviously reach out to her and so on. And what I want to encourage you is to look also into the seven day CRE challenge that I've created, guys, and take a look at that. And with that, I'm going to see you. Actually, this Thursday it's a, it's a holiday. I'm not going to see you then. So we're going to see next week, Monday. Take care of yourself, guys. Take care. <laughs>